I'm Tom Banchoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, which is home to the Religious Freedom Project, which along with the Maryland Bishops Conference has organized this event today. And um, this is the third panel, as I suggested. The first really uh, looked at the history of Catholic conversations, debates around religious freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, Vatican II as a critical juncture. We then, in our last panel, moved abroad, uh, looked at the relationship between religious freedom and, and human rights and the role of the church in world affairs. What we're going to do in this panel, as the title suggests, is bring things both back home to the United States but also up to the present and really focus on some of the controversial issues that have raised the salience of religious freedom questions in our polity over the last couple of years uh, and issues that have become more intense, more debated, more controversial, of course, in the run-up to the election, which is just a couple months away. We know from the historical overview that religious freedom, while broadly acknowledged as a foundational principle throughout the history of the United States, has always been controversial, the question of how to realize it in practice, the question of its relationship with other rights, uh, with state power and compelling state interests has been an ongoing source of controversy. What we've seen now, though, over the last couple of years is the emergence of a couple of very identifiable controversies which bring this down from the more theoretical level to the question of law and politics and elections, and that's what we're going to get in today. I'm thinking uh, in particular of two areas, the equal rights of gay and lesbian Americans, especially gay and lesbian couples, and how that relates to questions of religious freedom, and the provision of preventive care services, how you even describe it as very political, contraceptive services, uh, abortive patients. It's a very political uh, conversation, but essentially, uh, the intersection between religious freedom and health care and rights to health care in this country. Those are the two things that we'll sort of uh, talk about with our panel that I'll introduce in a second. I've asked them to focus on those two areas as well as the broader question that we touched on already and the Cardinal uh, also touched on at lunchtime, the degree to which religious freedom is really under threat in the United States whether the Catholic Church in that context is somehow uh, under threat and what the nature of that threat is. I've asked our panelists to think a little bit about that and perhaps pursue it in these two specific contexts of the rights of gay and lesbian Americans, same-sex marriage, and controversies surrounding the HHS mandate. They're each going to present eight to ten minutes of reflections. I'll try to spark a little conversation here on stage, and then we'll have plenty of time to, to open it up to you. So by way of introductions, we'll go in the order here that we're, we're seated. To my left is Mark Girolami, Assistant Professor of Law at St. John's University School of Law, where he is also the Assistant Director of the Center for Law and Religion. He's published widely in areas of constitutional law, criminal law, and religion, uh, and has a book forthcoming this spring with Harvard University Press entitled The Tragedy of Religious Freedom. Next to Mark is Kathleen Caveney. Kathy is the John P. Murphy Foundation Professor of Law and a Professor of Theology at Notre Dame. Known to many of you through her long list of publications on a range of topics at the intersection of law, religion, and morality, uh, with a specific expertise in much of her work on healthcare ethics. I want to mention uh, Kathy's, it's still forthcoming or is it physically out right now? physically appears next Thursday. Okay. It's still in its occultation. Okay. It's still, uh, we're, we're told it's imminent, its arrival is imminent. There's a nice flyer out back. We're referring to her book called Laws, Virtues, Fostering Autonomy and Solidarity in American Society, published by Georgetown University Press. And I'd also like to plug uh, a book event. We have a book event with Dan Philpott tomorrow and next Thursday. Kathy's going to present her book over at the Berkeley Center. So if you haven't already, sign up for our email list, check out our website, and so on. And, and please come to those events if they sound interesting to you. Our final presenter to my far left is another Mark, Mark Rienzi, an assistant professor at Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. 
uh, his teaching and publication center on Fourth, 14th Amendment issues, the free exercise of religion, freedom of speech. He's currently serving as counsel in several constitutional cases across the country, so he also brings the point of view of a practitioner to us today. Uh, and Mark also serves as a senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. So thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Thanks to our panel for being here. And Mark, why don't you get us started? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom, and thanks to Tom Farr and the Berkeley Center for uh, inviting me. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be among uh, this particular group of uh, panelists whose work I very much admire. And I join Tom in, in thanking all of you for, for coming out uh, for the Late Show. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the Toms, Toms Farr and Banshoff, have put uh, several organizing questions to us, three questions highlighting specific contemporary problems. I may get to some of those. More likely, I will leave them, actually, for my distinguished colleagues. Instead, <laughs> instead, I thought to begin with a question of the subject of the panel itself, conflicts between religious freedom and other rights. It's worth pausing, I think, over that word, conflict. It's been a word that we've heard uh, throughout the day in various of the panels. It's worth pausing to take the measure of the word before diving into some of the more specific, discrete issues. Because sometimes there can be a perhaps somewhat hasty desire to solve conflict, especially in this area, before understanding it. The wish to resolve a conflict in law, I think especially, can mask the depth and complexity of the conflict. Even more than that, uh, an overeager desire to resolve a conflict can um, mask the possibility that conflicts are part of every person's experience, and perhaps more controversially, that justice often does not consist of any sort of large-scale harmonious solution or a consensus either within an individual or within a polity. So we are asked to consider certain types of conflicts, conflicts between and among rights. Underlying each of these rights are multiple values. The right to religious liberty includes within it the conventional values of liberty, autonomy, equality, but also less conventional values like piety, asceticism, charity, devotion, self-control, fidelity, temperance, patience, and obedience. Perhaps borrowing a page from John Garvey, uh, those are only some of the values that religious liberty can help a person or an institution to achieve and therefore only some of the reasons that we should want to protect religious liberty as a right. But those values can and often do intersect and compete with others that obtain in the particular social, political, and legal culture, and conflicts arise whenever these various values of religious liberty clash with other values so that a decision must be made in favor of some and against others. Conflicts can occur not only among different types of values, as when a Roman Catholic's autonomy of conscience conflicts with a state's interest in a certain conception of equality or autonomy or health, but also among different values of the same type, as when a Roman Catholic's conception of equality and what that means for religious liberty conflicts with the conception of equality contained in, say, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, or what a court says the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment means, and what that means for religious liberty. We might be able to reach consensus in the abstract that equal treatment means the absence of unjust discrimination, but what counts as unjust discrimination is open to an array of conflicting interpretations, and those conflicting interpretations are underwritten by conflicting values. In fact, breaking things down a little bit, albeit surely all too crudely, 
uh, it seems to me that there are at least three ways in which the, value, which the values that underlie our rights can conflict. First, sometimes a single value, equality, for example, will, on inspection, fragment into different and conflicting values. Equality of opportunity is not the same thing as equality of outcome. Neither of those is the same thing as formal equality. Equality as fairness is not the same thing as equality as respect. Conflict is likely when a person or a group is committed to a value like equality, which fragments into conflicting values. Second, sometimes a person or a group will be committed to two or more values within a political culture which conflict liberty and equality in a democratic society, for example, or the rule of law and the authority of conscience. Third, sometimes a person or a group will be committed to multiple traditions, each of which contains values that conflict. A person, for example, who is both a Roman Catholic and a citizen in a liberal democracy and who has powerful allegiances to both cultural communities. Okay, I want to make a strong claim now. The state of being in conflict, the condition of experiencing and living within these kinds of conflict is often the best approximation of justice of which we are capable. Conflict may have been a great evil for Plato, who argued that from the proper ordering of the social classes would come harmony, and that harmony is a precondition of justice. But conflict is not a great evil for us. In fact, as the philosopher Stuart Hampshire once put it, conflict is perpetual. Why then should we be deceived? Conflict is an essential and deep feature of our society. Unavoidable and inevitable, as Dan Philpott said in the last panel, but more than that, desirable, since its source is our different backgrounds, different outlooks, different memories, different traditions. Now, of course, nothing that I have said about the justice of existing in a state of conflict negates the importance of compromise. But compromise does not mean harmony or the complete relaxation of tension. A good compromise is one where the tension between conflicting forces and impulses is perceptible and vivid, and both forces and impulses have been kept at full strength. A good compromise retains that sense of conflict in achieving a temporary, temporary holding together of forces in tension. Because of the fundamental nature of conflict, it is probable that our own lives could be characterized as a series of compromises of this kind between competing values. And much the same, in my view, may be said of the institutions of civil society. But neither in an individual, nor in an institution, nor in a larger political society is a state of conflict the sign of a defect. In fact, it isn't even a deviation from the normal. So when the second question posed to us by our very good conveners says, what are the tensions between religious freedom and gay rights in the same-sex marriage debate? How should they be resolved? My reaction, since I'm a law professor that deals with law students, is, like the ordinary law student, to resist the hypothetical. <laughs> they are meant, these conflicts, right? These conflicts here, conflicts which partake, in my view, of all of the three categories that I described, are not meant for harmonious resolution. They are meant for what Cardinal Wuerl's interlocutor communicated to him, as he said earlier, a respectful and fair audience, perhaps represented by the injunction Audi alteram partem, right? Listen to the other side. Perhaps they are susceptible of halting, partial, and temporary compromise. But the values that are at stake are constantly conflicting with each other, vying for supremacy, 
A gain for one will mean a loss for another. And that means that good compromises will be attuned to preserving the integrity of the conflicting positions because compromises which preserve the integrity of conflict are superior to those which destroy it. There generally is, in any contemporary society like ours, a mess, a chaos of opinions and moral attitudes. A reasonable person knows this. Those with strong opinions deplore the chaos and hope for consensus, usually a consensus in which their own opinions and attitudes are dominant. No state will realize perfect fairness in the representation of competing moral outlooks within it. But what I am suggesting is that in making its choices, a state should at least take care not to breeze past the deep importance of conflict in a misguided effort to reach that kind of harmony or consensus. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mark, for those framing comments. And uh, I want to ask you right now what this all means uh, and how you approach these issues more concretely. Um, but we'll come back to that in the, in the question and answer period. Let's first hear from Kathy Caveney. OK. Well, I think I'm going to take it a little bit more concrete. And so um, it will be interesting to see in the, in the dialogue whether the abstract and the concrete uh, can meet in a fruitful uh, conversation. Well, this panel is about the relationship of religious liberty to other rights and values in the context of the HHS mandate, same-sex marriage, and other controversies between uh, religious believers, uh, some religious believers, and some aspects uh, of, of state and uh, federal and even local governance. One of the things that make me uncomfortable about the way the discussion has gone thus far is I don't think we're framing the debate in a way that will help us maybe not get to a compromise, but at least get to a more precise understanding of what's at stake. For example, we've seen today, we've got the words religious freedom or religious liberty on the board behind us. It is seen as a thing, almost as a univocal thing, an abstract thing, that is conflicting with another abstract thing, also framed as a right, women's reproductive freedom or non-discrimination. And we're not getting far, or at least very far, in a fruitful discussion of one abstract right pitted against another abstract right. And we Catholics ought not to be surprised at this. After all, we all should have read or have read Alastair McIntyre, who diagnosed one of the fundamental problems of Western liberal democracies as this conflict of rights against rights in a, in a number of situations, the right to life versus the right to choice um, and various other sorts of rights. The right, um, uh, rights language talks about uh, you know, conflicts that, that don't, and it doesn't tell you how to resolve it. Marianne Glendon made a similar point in her book, Rights Talk. Um, abstract rights described in non-particular ways or non-specific ways battling against each other without any resolution. Um, Catholic notions of rights it, it, within the Catholic social justice tradition are not abstract entities battling one another. They're presented as claims which can be nuanced in different situations to meet with, to, uh, to augment with, to go along with other rights claims that are all contributing to the common good. So framing this, I think, as a battle of abstract rights against abstract rights isn't helpful and isn't in line with the best ways that we uh, pursue our tradition philosophically and theologically. A thicker, more precise, and more detailed understanding of the conflict, and there are numbers of conflicts at stake, is necessary. 
And another thing that's necessary, I think, is to try to see how things look from all points of view in the discussion, not merely our own point of view. How does the problem look from the perspective of the other side? in the discussion. We've heard a lot about natural law today, particularly from his eminence. Um, one of the things that's very, very interesting to me about the natural law tradition is that St. Thomas Aquinas says that uh, one of the basic principles of the natural law is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think it's very important in a liberal democratic society where there's a tremendous amount of religious and moral pluralism to try to look at how the issue that we're pressing, how the point that we're pressing looks from the other side. So what I want to do here, just for the next couple of minutes, and I'm sure it's contested and will be contestable, uh, is, is try to say what I think is at stake in a particular way, not in a general way. What's at stake for Catholics and Catholic institutions here with respect to religious liberty? Well, Catholic institutions aren't being forced to do something, or the in individuals involved in that is directly against their religious tradition, in the HHS mandate at least, worship an idol. They're not being prevented from fulfilling a religious requirement, being stopped, say, from using wine at mass. And they're not being forced, actually, even to do something that's seen as directly immoral by their tradition. Father Jenkins of Notre Dame isn't being forced to give uh, the shot of Depo Provera himself or to perform an abortion. Instead, what is at stake is making a contribution, a financial contribution, an organizational contribution to an immoral act which is being performed by somebody else. Uh, it counts, in my view, as what's called remote material cooperation with evil. Uh, that's a long, it's a separate conference the Berkeley Center can fund. But basically, <laughs> what cooperation with evil is about is contributing in some way, in a culpable way, to the wrongdoing, the primary wrongdoing of another party. And so what the Catholic institutions, I think, are involved here in is cooperation with evil, one step removed from the actual wrongdoing at stake. What's at stake on the other side? What worries me about the discussion of, uh, of this controversy, and, and it's in the Catholic press, so I'm calling my own community here to account. I think similar claims can be made about the way it's discussed in secular circles, but I'm talking to us what I think we can do better. How does it look if we apply the golden rule? Worries me that we talk about it as if it's simply a question of access to contraception. You hear people say, well, women can buy their own contraception, or I don't want to subsidize you know, so-and-so's sex life. Uh, it makes it look as if that's what's at stake on the other side. So you've got religious freedom and a kind of sexual license against one another. I don't think that's a golden rule way of framing the issue. It's about if you're taking seriously how it looks uh, from the perspective of the people making the law, preventive medicine. What's key is that we're trying to propose a whole benefit package that's a basic benefit package that's available to everyone. And a key component of that benefit package is preventive medicine. Preventive medicine, they want to be made available without a co-payment. Why? Well, it turns out the evidence that they've looked into suggests that if preventive services are available without a copayment, people are more likely to access to them, whether or not they can afford them. If you don't have to pay for the copayment, you're more likely to use the service. Um, and they've, you, know, you can call into question the evidence for this, but that's what they're saying. With respect to women's, uh, women's uh, preventive services, it says removing cost-sharing requirements let women decide which preventive services they'll use and when. In fact, one study found that the rate of women getting a mammogram went up as much as 9% when cost-sharing was removed. So the contraceptive mandate is part of a whole series of preventive services that are uh, meant to help women uh, avoid chronic and uh, even acute illnesses. What accounts for the contraceptive 
inclusion in this. Well, this is what it says if you go to the web page. To reduce the weight of, rate of unintended pregnancies, which account for almost half of the pregnancies in the U.S. in 2001, the report urges that HHS consider adding the full range of FDA-approved contraceptive methods, as well as patient education and counseling for all women with reproductive capacity. Women with unintended pregnancies are more likely to receive delayed or no preventive care and to smoke, consume alcohol, be depressed, and experience domestic violence during pregnancy. Unintended pregnancy also increases the uh, risk of babies born preterm or at a low birth weight, both of which raise chances of health and developmental problems. So that's why HHS says it's putting in this mandate. And I think we can all agree that that set of goals is good. The argument is about the means to achieve the goals. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that artificial contraception isn't a good and acceptable, or even in the long term, a way of, of, of achieving these goals that's going to lead to flourishing. It's treating that as an interpretation of the requirements of the natural law. So this helps us see, actually, what's at stake, I think, for the church in, in, in this debate. The problem isn't the actual contribution of money to contraception. That's minuscule. The problem is that in this debate, normalizing contraception and making church entities go along with it is, is, is causing scandal. That's also a technical term. It's going to make the church treat as, uh, as morally acceptable and good as a legitimate preventive service, something that isn't in its view. It's being conscripted into teaching a false proposition of morality from its point of view. But here's the rub. Not everybody in the United States agrees that the Roman Catholic Church is the authoritative interpreter of the natural law. It's partly what Protestantism was about too, right? On this particular point, in fact, some Christians and indeed some Catholics view the use of contraception as a morally responsible way to plan their families and exercise stewardship. And what I'd like to suggest is that having people who believe that, they're not promiscuous, they're not simply trying to get their contraception paid for, but they see this as a way of exercising their fiduciary obligations toward their family, having them be restricted by a religious viewpoint they don't believe, I'd like to submit is also an aspect of religious liberty. And I'd like to point to uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians and Paul's letter to the Romans you know, as, as a point. You can go home and read this, but what basically St. Paul said was being subject to a set of religious um, rules that you don't yourself believe in is a restriction on your Christian liberty. Now, that doesn't settle the issue. It simply says there are religious liberty claims on the other side. And I'd like to suggest we could look at this as a situation of religious freedom in conflict. Um, the rights of religious employers versus the rights of religious uh, or uh, of employees who don't happen to go along with the tenets of that religion. Um, there's a case, and we can, I don't want to get into the weeds of the legal stuff here, so I'm not bringing in for that, but for the moral claim, uh, United States versus Lee, which is a Supreme Court case dealing with this, kind of recognized that conflict by saying, when followers of a particular sect enter into commercial activity as a matter of choice, the limits they accept on their own conduct as a matter of conscience and faith are not to be superimposed on the statutory schemes which are binding on others in that activity. Granting an exemption from Social Security taxes to an employer operates to impose the employer's religious faith on the employees. So in our discussion of the conflict, I think we also need to look at what level we're locating the claim of religious freedom. We heard in the first panel today that the first move toward religious freedom was cuius regio eius religio. There was religious freedom on the parts of various princes to organize their community in the way they wanted. And you could get up and move maybe communities if you didn't like it. Do we want in the United States a principle that's cuius negotium 
eus religio. Whoever's business it is, whosoever enterprise it is, that religious framework rules. How far do we want that to govern? And how far do we want there to be a basic package of rights that are available to, or uh, benefits, uh, rights, benefits that are available to everybody uh, no matter where they work? It seems to me that's one of the tensions that's at stake in this that hasn't been looked at uh, carefully enough. So as I see this, um, if, if we get into the details of the conflict, um, I, I see a conflict that's more nuanced and, and less black and white than it's appeared in some of the, 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 uh, the church's kind of promotional literature on this. Um, I think we've got a question of religious freedom on the part of the church, certainly, but I also think we have a question of public order and welfare and the extent to which that uh, can be instantiated in a basic benefit package. I think we've got the bishop's concern for the, the moral and religious pedagogy that can, that's associated with sponsoring a benefit package. On the other hand, I think we have a question of the level at which religion, religious freedom attaches, simply to the institution um, or also to the individuals who work for that institution. After all, we don't make every right sort of dependent upon whether an employer wants to respect it or not. The child welfare laws, there's a lot of things we impose on employers um, even and, and interfere with their freedom of conscience. Um, at least, but we think that that's the right thing to do. I'd like to suggest that the new proposed regulations by um, by the uh, Obama administration, if they can be worked out in sufficient detail, actually might help resolve this problem. Um, what they want to say is there's the group of narrowly defined religious uh, entities, churches and people who meet a very narrow definition, don't have to offer uh, contraception at all. But this larger group, like uh, hospitals and universities, there's a compromise plan. And what they're trying to do is to say, yes, your employees will get access to this, even though you're a religious institution, but you will not have to reach out for it or sponsor it or pay for it. We will have the insurance company do that if you're an insured plan, or we will have the third party administrator do that if you're, um, if you're self-insured. If that can work out, I'm not sure why that isn't at least a, a, a tenable option um, that tries to do a golden rule analysis, seeing how it looks from the perspective of the employees and also seeing how it looks from the perspective of the, the religiously affiliated uh, hospitals and institutions such as schools that aren't covered by the pure exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was a different kind of presentation, very rich in detail that linked back to some of the broader issues that, that Mark mentioned. We'll have a lot to follow up on, but first let's hear from the other Mark to my far left. That's what I like people to call me, the other Mark. Um, <laughs> Mark the second, maybe. Um, Kathy mentioned uh, religious diversity and the fact that, uh, the obvious fact that not everybody agrees with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we obviously have great religious diversity in this country, lots of people of different faiths, lots of people of no faith at all. I think it is, it is fairly obvious but worth pointing out at the outset that in a religiously diverse place, in a pluralistic democracy, you will from time to time have situations where uh, one person's religious liberty runs into some other people's rights. And I think generally speaking, in a liberal pluralistic democracy, the right answer should be for, uh, where possible, us to find ways to work around the claims of religious liberty so that, in fact, we are not forcing people as the price of participation in society that they have to shed some of their religious beliefs to be here. I'd like to start by uh, talking about the issue of conflict a little bit like Mark did uh, and making the claim that I think there are fewer deep conflicts of rights involving religious liberty than, than there may first seem at first glance. Um, one of the prompt questions talk, asked to talk about the conflict between religious liberty and same-sex marriage 
if you think about the recent Chick-fil-A controversy that was, that was in the news, uh, there you had Dan Cathy, who owns his, his business Chick-fil-A, uh, who made some statements about same-sex marriage and how he, his understanding of, of marriage and religion is that same-sex marriage is a terrible thing uh, and that uh, America, I'm paraphrasing here, but that America should watch out because God is, is, is paying attention and sitting in judgment. Um, obviously, those comments came out. They became wildly unpopular and several things happened. I want to leave aside for a second the question of government responses to Chick-fil-A, which I think can raise some, some conflict of rights issues. But I want to talk about private responses to Chick-fil-A. Uh, what happened in that controversy? Well, a lot of private individuals said, I don't like that statement, and I don't want to do business with Chick-fil-A. I don't want to associate with Chick-fil-A. I don't want a penny of my money to go to Chick-fil-A in the business that, that supports Dan Cathy, because I disagree with him. And lots of nonprofit corporations took the same stance. Several colleges said, we don't want Chick-fil-A on our campus because we don't agree with the statements by Dan Cathy about same-sex marriage. Uh, and a lot of, of for-profit corporations did the same thing. Jim Henson Corporation, uh, the company that makes the Muppets and the Muppet movies, publicly said, we can no longer have, I think they had some product tie-ins with, uh, with the kids' meals at Chick-fil-A. They said, we can no longer be associated with Chick-fil-A. We don't want a penny of our money going to Chick-fil-A. We don't want any association with Chick-fil-A. We disagree with what they stand for. We can't be involved. I would like to suggest that, to me, that is, it may not be quite right to say it's not a conflict of rights, but to go back to something Mark said, I think it's a conflict of rights or conflict that the government should have no business resolving. In other words, I'm quite certain that Dan Cathy found a lot of things said about him to be deeply hurtful and offensive. I'm quite certain he found a lot of them to be uh, financially hurtful, I assume. I don't really know, but I assume he's suffering some financial pain. I assume he didn't like hearing th things said about him. I assume he didn't like hearing things said about his religion. I assume he found it all deeply hurtful. Um, but I don't think there's any conflict of rights going on when other private citizens say, I don't want to be associated with that. I don't want a penny of my money to go to that. I don't want to participate in anything that has to do with that because I think that's wrong. I think a lot of the conflicts that we often think about when we think about religious freedom are what I'll call, for lack of a better term, Chick-fil-A conflicts. It's conflicts where two private parties are involved, and party A says to party B, hey, you may have a right to do that. In other words, I don't think anyone, I haven't heard anyone say, Dan Cathy doesn't have the right of free speech to say what he thinks, or Dan Cathy doesn't have the right of free religion to believe what he thinks. Um, or if people said that, I assume it was a small, small, small minority. I think virtually everyone in the debate recognizes Dan Cathy's exercising his constitutional rights. He's entitled to do it. But I think the other people are exercising their constitutional rights, too. And I don't actually think that's the type of conflict of rights that the courts or the government ought to be in the business of resolving. I think free people ought to have the right to say, you're entitled to your views on the world, and you're entitled to believe and do what you think, and I'm entitled to mine. And if I don't want to pay for what you're doing, I don't want a penny of my money to go toward, I don't want to associate with it, I think they should be perfectly willing and free and able to do that. Um, so when I think about conflicts between religious freedom and same-sex marriage, um, you know, I think you can focus on, on a pretty small set of conflicts. So the deeply religious person who is the town clerk of, of marriage licenses, uh, who says, based on my religion, I can't be involved in facilitating anything that has to do with the same-sex marriage. Well, theoretically, that person is in a position where they could be conflicting with someone else's right to same-sex marriage. I don't think you can say the same thing about someone who is a private wedding photographer who says, you know what, that, that's an event that I don't want to go portray. I don't want to be part of that. I'm a free person, too. You can have your right to do what you want. I don't want to be involved in it. Um, I think the same thing comes up in the healthcare context. Um, and before we get to the HHS mandate stuff, the more traditional healthcare context in which this comes up, of course, is conscience clauses related to abortion. Um, and the most recent manifestation of that has actually been on things like emergency contraceptives, pharmacies, pharmacists who say, I don't want to participate in selling or dispensing that drug. Um, again, to me, I don't think when a private pharmacist says, hey, I can't be involved in that, that that is really a conflict of rights. In other words, I don't think, generally speaking, that the right to obtain Plan B or, or the week after pill Ella or, or any of these drugs, I don't think that the right to obtain it entails the right to force unwilling private individuals to give it to you. I think the right is the right to get it without the government stopping you. And I think those are two very different things. And I think if the government were trying to stop you, if the head of the FDA said, 
I have a religious objection to Plan B. Based on my religion, I can't stamp the paperwork to approve it. There, I think you have a true conflict of rights. Uh, but I don't think you really have a conflict of rights when a private pharmacist says, just like the people in the Chick-fil-A example said, I can't be involved in that. I don't want to be involved in that. Go on to the next pharmacy. Um, the fact that those types of true conflicts are, I think, fairly rare doesn't mean that, that the, the whole issue of conflicts between religious freedom and other rights doesn't pose a serious threat to religious freedom. I think it does. Uh, if you look at some, some of the litigation that's happened over the past few years, though, one of the things that comes up over and over again is that where there are these claims that there's this deep conflict and religion must yield, uh, when, you, when you get into the nuts and bolts of the cases, you almost always find that, that in fact, there's a relatively easy workaround that doesn't require drumming all the, the Christians out of the pharmacy com community or forcing all of the people who don't believe in same-sex marriage out of the wedding photography community. Um, so in, in litigation in Illinois for the past, I think, seven years now, after Governor Blagojevich said every pharmacist in the state has to sell Plan B, well, over the years, eventually, the state has to come forward with its evidence. And the state's claim was there's a, there's a big conflict of rights. People are being denied their drug that they need access to. Uh, but when they were forced to put on some actual evidence of the problem, the state had to admit, actually, that it was not aware of a single actual person over the seven years who was unable to get the drug. They had no evidence of a single human being. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. One of these pharmacies was in downtown Chicago. There are 30 pharmacies within a stone's throw of that guy's business. There's absolutely no compelling government interest to say, we need to get that guy to give it out because 29 other people within the one mile radius is not enough. We need 30. Um, and in Washington state, they had a very similar case where the governor there imposed a very similar rule and the claim was the same. We have a deep conflict of rights. We need to make sure people have access to the drugs until they actually had to put on the evidence. And when they actually had to put on the evidence in Washington, like in Illinois, the answer was actually there's no human being who has been unable to get the drug because there's always a pharmacy next door. Could it be inconvenient? Could it make somebody go uh, to the next pharmacy over? Absolutely it could. Um, but this is a drug that's widely available. You can get it over the internet. Um, and in all of these places, the government had actually made no serious effort to make it more widely available itself. So uh, again, there was a lot of evidence that, in fact, uh, what was claimed to be a deep-seated problem. It's, it's a big enough problem. In Illinois, here was the situation. They were trying to force people who were in their early 50s and had young kids and had only known one profession in their lives. Governor Blagojevich said, well, those people need to find another profession. Those people need to get out of the profession. And the government was willing to drum them out of the pharmacy business, close down their pharmacies so that they don't provide any drugs, uh, over a health risk that didn't really exist because there wasn't really and truly a conflict with religion. Uh, to turn to the HHS mandate situation, one, uh, the federal government in, in the cases, in the lawsuits, has made a whole lot out of the access argument. So I, I appreciate Kathy's point that uh, it can be made more broadly, and at times the government does make it more broadly. Uh, but quite frequently, the government does make the access argument, both in uh, court papers and in uh, public statements, that this is about access. Uh, and I do think, to the extent you frame the issues about access, uh, to me it's very difficult to view it as seriously being a conflict with religion as if there couldn't be lots of other ways to provide access to the drugs short of forcing unwilling people to be part of it. Just one example is Title X. One of the cases is in North Carolina with Belmont Abbey College, a college run by a community of monks, and Belmont Abbey College said, look, we can't be involved in buying this stuff and giving it out. Well, if you, if you do a little bit of looking on, Title X's web, on the Title X websites, what you find is that the federal government is in the business of giving out the drug and gives it out to tens of thousands of people every year in the state of North Carolina. If the government thinks more people need to be given access to the drug, the government could give it to them directly. Uh, there's really no need that the government has to force unwilling people to be involved. Um, I think it's a fair argument uh, to say that, well, maybe this is remote participation with evil. Maybe it's not as direct as some people think. Uh, as a matter of how the law and society should approach that, though, I think the right answer is that that's a decision to be made by the individual religious believer or individual religious institution. In other words, many institutions may say, you know what, that's right. I'm not giving the shot. I'm not taking the drug. Therefore, I'm not closely enough involved in the evil, and therefore, I can pay for it. And if those people say that's fine with their religious convictions, I think the right answer is great, good for you, move on. You have nothing to worry about or nothing to sue about. 
But I think the fact of the matter is that for many people, they don't view the participation as remote enough, and in a free and pluralistic liberal democracy, they ought to be able to make the decision that in fact that is too close participation and that's something that they cannot participate in. And I think the same thing goes for the government's proposed accommodation, which was proposed by the president in February. We still haven't seen any actual rule language on it. Uh, but if we give them the benefit of the doubt that something is coming, I think what's fair to say is they might come up with a solution that might satisfy some people. They might come up with a solution that might satisfy a lot of people. And if they do, I think that's a great thing. But at the end of the day, if there are some people who say, you know what, I still can't be doing this because I can't hand out the insurance policy, which the government has said has stapled to the back of it the right to get the drug, even though you're telling me I'm not paying for it. Uh, that is a moral claim that I think a lot of people, it's a moral view that I think a lot of people and a lot of institutions have. And I don't think it should be for the government to say, well, we have decided what ought to be good enough for your religious faith or what ought to be good enough for your conscience. It may be good enough for a lot of people's conscience, and that's great and good for them. But it may not be good enough for other people's consciences. And in those types of situations, I, again, think the right answer is that the government ought to be in the business in a pluralistic society of finding ways to work around that disagreement and to say, OK, do we need to make it the price of admission to the public square that you have to be willing to pay for these drugs? Does that have to be the price of admission? And if so, why does that have to be the price of admission? I think there's a very good argument that it shouldn't be. And if you think about the early conflicts, uh, the, the fights over uh, health care providers who say, I can't perform an abortion, um, or, the, or the fights in Illinois and Washington over Plan B, one of the really big problems with that is, well, what does it say to young Catholic or Christian or otherwise pro-life people who are coming up and thinking about careers in those states? Well, one of the things it says, one of the things I would certainly say uh, if I were advising someone in that position is, boy, if you're pro-life in Illinois, I don't think I would go into pharmacy. So we've just spent the past seven years fighting about whether once you go into pharmacy, you have to give out drug X. And in states that authorize assisted suicide, I think the same issue is lurking, although there, most of the time when they do it, they do it with a conscience clause. So in those situations, we're dealing with set specific professions. And I think it's bad enough in those specific professions that we have the message from the government, if you have this religious belief, you shouldn't be in this profession. What's to me, more troubling about the HHS mandate is how global it is. This is not just pharmacists or not just wedding services providers. This is everybody. If you want to run a bakery, you want to run a pharmacy, you want to run a widget shop, you have to be willing to give out insurance that covers these drugs. And if that violates your religion, you have to go find something else to do. To me, that's a very serious burden on religion, and it's an entirely unnecessary one. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, well, I'm going to try to provoke our panelists a little bit. Uh, you, all, you all resisted the way in which we s laid out the, uh, the terms of our conversation as a conflict between rights, and maybe because you're, you're, you're lawyers and you're attentive to the complexities of the issues, um, you gave very nuanced uh, discussions, in Mark's case, a sort of overview of, of conflict and how it's, it's really business as usual. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Kathy, uh, a kind of vision of how we can find a compromise on this contentious issue of the HHS mandate. And then Mark, uh, on the same-sex marriage issue, you seem to suggest there really aren't that many fronts. There really isn't all that much tension. You gave a couple of examples, wedding uh, city hall clerks, wedding photographers, and so on. I'm a political scientist, though. And when I look out and I, and I see what's going on um, in this election, in particular the stance of the, the Catholic bishops we heard uh, Cardinal World talk about a new and virulent secularism uh, and the church under siege. We, we've had the fortnight for freedom. The political fronts are being set around this notion that there are conflicts, real conflicts at stake. So if I could provoke you a little bit to, to speak to that wider context in which our church leadership has taken very clear positions uh, and how that relates to the more nuanced analysis that you all, you all have given. Maybe, Mark, you can go first. Well, so I guess I'll say this first, having been uh, chided probably justly for uh, being too abstract uh, and just listening to, to, my, to my colleagues, um, it, it seems, I'm, I'm going to put in another little pitch for abstraction, if that's all right. Uh, and, that, that, and that's because, and that's, be last one. and that's because, well, well but I, I think this, this may, yeah. uh, at least obliquely, 
uh, address, address the question that you just raised, Tom, and that's we, we disagree about everything. We disagree about the level at which to frame the debate. We disagree about to whom religious liberty should apply, the institution or the individual. We disagree about the context in which a right actually uh, 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 is violated and the context, therefore, in which law can get involved. Uh, we disagree about, as I said in, in, in my opening remarks, what happens when different ideas of equality are in conflict. We disagree about how to characterize the sorts of things that, say, the administration is after, whether to call it health or whether to call it uh, access to contraceptives or whether to call it sexual autonomy. Uh, we disagree on the other side about what, what to call it, how to frame it, levels of generality. And because of all of these disagreements, uh, these uh, abstracting away and trying to think about how to characterize these various conflicts, I think is a helpful exercise. I think it will be helpful to the church leadership to think about it in these terms. I absolutely agree with Kathy, and I, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise, that, that we should just sort of uh, think about these issues in terms of conflicts of abstract rights and stop there. No, uh, and, and, but, but, but I do think that because of the depth of the conflicts that we face, and because these conflicts, you know, they're not so bad. It's good that we have these, these, these problems because it means that we're complicated. Um, that, mean, that means that, um, uh, that and I, I guess I'll, as a lawyer, I'll put in a pitch for, for legal resolution. Legal resolution, uh, at least for the kinds of cases that Mark uh, is talking about that deserve legal resolution, proceed in a way that's well suited to the kinds of conflicts that we face. They proceed casuistically. They proceed by attention to the particular facts. They proceed by reference to a background of doctrine. You know, law is one of the only disciplines, it's the only academic discipline I can think of, other than theology, where there is an authoritative body of doctrine. That doctrine isn't just something that people have to become familiar with or that, pe that it's there to react against. It's something that binds people. It's something that has authority of itself just in virtue of its being doctrine. That means that the kinds of, uh, a, the kinds of attention to background that was talked about in the first, that were talked about in the first, in the first panel uh, and tradition uh, in coordination with incremental and modest change where it can be made makes law a, well, maybe a useful instrument for our predicament in these, particularly because of the complexity of, our, of the conflicts that we face. Kathy, can you speak to this? I'm very frustrated, I guess, with this framing of it as, uh, as a war between secularism and religion on, on every level. Um, I'm not saying there aren't pockets, but the trouble is I know, and I know by studying um, you know, some of the data on this, that there are a number of believing Christians, believing Jews, um, maybe even some believing Muslims, I don't know there too, who are advocating on behalf of same-sex marriage as what they believe is, is a commitment to their moral reality. They're arguing um, for a development in the tradition uh, to, to encompass that. The same thing on contraception. John Noonan wrote a book w where he was arguing that Catholic teaching on contraception can develop based on the natural law. Now, whether or not you agree with that, and it's very clear the current magisterium didn't, you know, to call people who do not agree with this remote application of the general principles of natural law secularists or opposed to religion or relativists, I think sets up a fight that we don't need to have. And it particularly sets up a fight with the people who are under 30. Uh, who have different views on this, but may still love God very much um, and, and still love their religious traditions, but are trying to develop it. Maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, but I don't think 
it should be framed as a battle between religion, which stands for all these things, all religion stands for all of this, and all of secularity, which stands for a different set of things. That may be true on an elite level, that may be true among some people, but it's not true of most people you know, that I know, ordinary people, not eggheads in, in the academy. Um, so I wish we wouldn't frame it that way. I, I wish we would see ourselves as trying together to figure out what the principles of the natural law require, what moral reality requires, when we get to very hard and difficult cases. And that what we are arguing about is that. We're not arguing about a commitment to God, a commitment to equality, a commitment to the well-being of women, a commitment to religion. We're arguing about how to handle hard cases. And if we can do that, reframe it as a discussion of hard cases, then maybe we won't have the tremendous amount of dissension uh, in the world. And I'd like to just give one last thing on this. You know, um, I think we need to be a little bit more Augustinian on some of this. Augustine says that we, every human being pursues good subspecie boni, under the aspect of the good. You know, the culture war mentality that we have, framing one another in this way, doesn't really leave a lot of room to see our interlocutors as pursuing something under the aspect of, of the good. That's one thing. Then the second thing is, we're not just dealing with questions of religion as in pure worship. And I completely agree that religion isn't limited to questions of pure worship. But what we are partly arguing about is what the common morality of this country is. And, and what are the requirements we're going to hold constant across the board, and what requirements we're going to allow um, some people to um, defer from you know, for another good. But part of what we're talking about is what is our common morality on these issues? Um, so we can't treat it as if it is a pure religious issue um, on the other side either. It's both. Um, I, I completely uh, agree with Kathy that, um, one, that it's not, it's not correct to say that th it is all simply a battle between religion as if religion has just one set of views in it. It doesn't. Um, and secularism as if everybody who disagrees with what you heard from Cardinal World this morning is a secularist as opposed to um, a disagreeing Catholic or, or, or a member of, of some other faith. Um, and I, too, have heard people make arguments for the contraceptive mandate. For, I, I believe President Obama made an argument for same-sex marriage that was expressly religious. Um, one, I think, useful starting point is to say that there should be nothing wrong with making an expressly religious argument um, on either side about what you think the right answer to these questions is. Uh, and I do think sometimes in our culture uh, there's an effort to say religious arguments about what's right and wrong don't have a place here. That's invalid. You shouldn't be taking that into the public square. Um, I do think uh, these are hard questions, and, it, and, and, and again, I agree with Kathy that it is, is not useful to frame them as, for example, you know, one side you know, likes women and is willing to protect women's health, and the other side hates women and doesn't. Um, I think that is facially silly, frankly. Um, and I think the important thing from a religious freedom point of view is to say that as we work out these issues and as we talk about what through our laws should be a common morality and the law does uh, impose and, and lead and, and reinforce morality in some way, uh, but that again, in a, in a place with the Free Exercise Clause, in a place with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, we ought to engage in that discussion conscious of the fact that people have different religious views and that it is a particularly bad thing for the government to be in the business of saying not just we're going to set the common morality with the law, uh, but that uh, you, you, and you cannot participate in business, you cannot participate in the public square, you cannot do X, Y, or Z unless you are willing to go with this level of common morality. To me, the, the set of places where the government should have the power to do that ought to be really, really small where there's something particularly important going on, and other than that, the government ought to be in the business of doing what the, what, what the federal statute says, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says, which is going out of its way where it can, at least, to not burden religion unnecessarily. Go ahead. 
Um, I've been permitted to ask you a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> by our august moderator. So you don't need my permission. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, well, all right. So you're, you're focusing on businesses, right? Now, so would In you part, let yeah. yes, CBS, you know, say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to hire any anybody who's not going to prescribe Plan B. You know, I'm not going to. You know, I'm CVS. I own the vast majority. They're from Woonsocket, Rhode Island, just down the hill from me, um, where I grew up. Uh, but they, that doesn't, but at any rate, would you let them say, uh, I'm not going to hire people? Like, would you let a hospital say, I'm not going to hire a doctor who's not going to perform, uh, you know, abortions or a nurse who's not going to take care of them? So if, if, if we go, the, what worries me is, isn't just the specific cases before us, but you know, we've got a whole range of issues to balance. And just saying, well, businesses get to do what they want isn't going to help either, because then we're going to end up in a mess where the businesses can say, I'm not going to hire people who aren't doing things either. And right now, we do have laws that say hospitals can't get federal funds and discriminate against people you know, who won't perform abortions. And I think that's a very, very good law. So we've got intervention in the business realm. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I don't, I don't have any problem, for example, with Title VII saying, uh, I mean, th that, that law says a hospital can't refuse to hire someone because they won't perform abortions. It also says you can't refuse to hire somebody who at other times has performed abortions. So under that exact law, the, a Catholic hospital couldn't say, I won't hire you because you used to perform abortions. They don't have to let them perform them in the hospital. Right. Uh, but, it, but it cuts both ways. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, to me, that is not, um, that is not infringing on either side's religious liberty. If you were to say to the Catholic hospital, you have to allow abortions in your hospital, even if you're not performing them, you have to let people do it there, then I think you're forcing the business to be involved in a way that you're not necessarily forcing them if you just say, well, you have to be willing to hire people. Um, simply hiring a human being who in the past has done X How about seems to me- doing them simultaneously at the hospital down the road? I think under the church amendment, the, the, the hospital cannot fire you for that. Um, I, think that, I, think that I think that was the compromise in 1970, whatever, in the church yeah. amendment. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we've surfaced now a lot of, of great and contentious issues. We have a lot of time, I would say, a, a half an hour uh, for conversation. There are a couple of roving mics. I already see a lot of hands. We'll try to get through even more now, uh, um, most all of your questions. Uh, I'll, when you get the mic, please stand up, briefly introduce yourself, and, and keep your question or, or comment short. Kyle, right next to you is Amy. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Amy Ullman at the law school here. Um, my question for Mark the second <laughs> is um, w when you kind of tried to circumscribe the problem uh, in uh, in terms of the impact on conflicts between uh, private citizens and their opinions, what do you do in response to um, the the sense that there's an analogy to race discrimination um, and how how do you how do you work with that, Mike? My question for Kathy and possibly Mark the first um, is uh, is the concern that um, there might be a sort of slippery slope problem to um, that it's one thing to participate remotely in in funding birth control and perhaps it's another thing to participate remotely in uh, funding abortion, and so um, so, what do you do with the concerns that there's a pretty quick analogy that the same analysis should apply? Um, you know, as, as to the analogy with race, uh, I I don't think the analogy is quite right, frankly. I think if you look at the rights we're talking about, um, if you look at Lawrence and Casey, the the two places constitutionally where. Uh, the rights we're talking about come from. The, the way the court gets to those rights is it says the 14th Amendment protects a realm of liberty that includes the right to, I'm paraphrasing Justice Kennedy here, but the right to define one's own concept of the universe, of the mystery of life, uh, and that basically on these life, death, sex issues, uh, what, what the government protects is the right of individual people to make their own decisions about them. To me, it would be odd to say that we arrive at the abortion right or the gay marriage right through this road of saying, well, the Constitution protects your right to make up your own mind, because this is a deeply personal, deeply important decision that each human being ought to be able to figure out for themselves. It would be odd to arrive at the rights down that path and then say, once we're through that path, we're going to slam the door behind us and nobody else gets the right to make their own decisions about whether, they will, how, whether and how they will participate in it. So I, I just think it's different uh, in, in the way in which we got to the rights. Um, on the question of the slippery slope, I think that is a, a legitimate question. I, I, 
I see a, a, a big uh, area, at least jurisprudentially, between you know things that don't violate either the free exercise clause or the establishment clause. So I see a wide range of accommodations being constitutionally permissible, but not necessarily constitutionally required. And I think abortion has been legislatively treated separately. Conscience rights have been protected in cases. And I think you could make a basis both from the internal perspective of, uh, of the Catholic uh, tradition where, you know, if you're contributing to an abortion, you're contributing to something that's actually not just a wrongful act on the part of the other person, the pure contraception is. And th there is a sort of, you know, it seems to me a stronger employee right there to, you know, determine what counts as right or wrong for themselves that doesn't involve the, directly the virtue of justice than in the case of abortion, which the church believes involves the, you know, the question of justice. So I, I think there are some barriers that can be placed there. I do agree with Mark. I mean, I'm raising the cooperation with evil argument, um, not as, as a legal argument. I don't think it has a basis in a, but as a Catholic, I'm saying, what's going on here, gentlemen? This is, you know, remote material cooperation with evil. It's been signed off on in other cases. So why, what's the worry? I think in a democratic society, we are risking a lot in being a, you know, a, a constitutional democracy, and we are risking getting things wrong. So part of what this requires us to do is to explain to one another why abortion is different than contraception and try to make the case for, the, you know, for a difference there. Um, we're not assured in a liberal democracy where the people have a lot of say of getting it right. So we have to make the case. I'll just answer quickly, Amy, with respect to the, um, the issue of, as a legal matter under RIFRA, uh, that is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This is a statute, not, not with what Kathy was talking about, the, the constitutional uh, uh, religion clauses. Um, the, the RIFRA requires a substantial burden that the, that the religious claimant uh, make an argument that his conscience or his freedom of, of um, uh, his, his religious freedom has uh, suffered a substantial burden. The difficulty with making a distinction between uh, abortion and contraception uh, is that though there may well be differences, differences of, of uh, Catholic moral theology, uh, they're not particularly differences that we're interested in the state making. Uh, and that the state shouldn't be uh, in the business of deciding that uh, abortion may be a substantial burden on free exercise, but the provision of contraceptive services is not. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say to that. Who decides if it's not the state? Uh, well, no, yeah. it's, 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 it's certainly the state when it comes to filing a legal claim. But even there, the analysis from the court would largely be sincerity of the religious believer. In other words, I don't think the court is likely to second guess the religious believer who says, I believe it is a deep violation of my religious faith to buy contraceptives for somebody. Uh, if the judge thinks that person is sincere, I think there's, it's going to be very difficult for the government to say it's not a substantial burden because, oh, abortion would be, but this isn't. I, I think it'll be fairly different. And from that point of view, there would be no distinction as insofar as the legal claim is, is concerned. All right, let's collect uh, three questions. Uh, Dan Madigan over here, and then we got a question there as well, and then come back down here to okay, I, David I'm, Novak. I'm Hannah Claus. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, and I'm one of the many people who testified to the IOM hearings in preparation of what ended up as a contraceptive mandate. And I'd like to go back to the fact that most people are entitled to all facts before they make an informed decision, whereas the mandate has narrowed the compensable modalities for family planning to commodities for which you can get money, and some of which are quite harmful. And I think that that is plain wrong. Uh, before you foist only contraceptive steroids of, in one way of delivering or another, or IUDs, all of which have known complications on people, or gadgets, or surgery, 
and you tell them de facto that there is no other alternative because we're not going to pay for any other, that's wrong. Natural family planning is perfectly useful. It works, even though they have managed very often to suppress that information. If you look at the PDR, they still say there's 25% failure rate, which is pure rubbish. There's so you, much information that says there isn't. Do you have a question? And my question is, when you have truth that takes a beating in this, as it does, why are you talking about higher rights when, in fact, what we're talking about is not giving people informed choice to begin with? Thank you. Dan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Madigan, uh, Department of Theology here. Uh, before I came here, I, I used to teach in a pontifical university in Rome where uh, the university uh, paid the state for each individual employee uh, for their, their health care, which explicitly included abortion services as well as contraception. Now, somehow that was considered perfectly acceptable to do, uh, even by pontifical institutions in Rome. Uh, I'm just wondering why, why it is that some similar uh, understanding cannot be uh, arrived at here. This is not a case of simply uh, you know, taxation, you give it to the government and they use it for what they want. This is specifically for uh, health care and it's specifically stated that it includes abortion services. So uh, I wonder whether our whole problem here is not the fact that uh, we don't have uh, a, a single payer uh, government health service. Yeah, it's hard to translate these controversies across national boundaries. Uh, so maybe there's some reflections on that. David? Yeah. Uh, at the risk of uh, inserting myself among uh, three lawyers, uh, I would like to, I think, agree with Kathy Capeney, qua philosophical theologian, uh, and throw something out, and, and I'm curious if you would agree with this or not. I, I very much agree with your notion that we must break down this notion that there are religionists on this side and secularists on this side, and uh, that they're really, it's, it's an either or kind of situation. And I think that the, the um, uh, 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 tertium quid, as it were, the, the, the third position, is the question of secularity. I think that both um, uh, re religious, uh, uh, thinkers and seculars would agree that there's a certain area called secularity. Secularity minimally means that there are areas of life in which we cannot simply deduce from revealed precepts what, what, what ought to be done, that it's left to, to, to human uh, judgment and even innovation. Now, the difference is, is that at that point, this is a point of agreement. A mistake that I think that is made on both sides is that secularists will say that secularity must be deduced from a type of secularism which is really de facto atheism, which means that we simply cannot in any way acknowledge a, a divine lawgiver under any circumstances. Um, religious people on the other side, especially people who talk about, and I, this is something that crops up, People should not talk about the natural law. They should always say, use the Latin lex naturalis because Latin doesn't have a definite article. There is not the natural law. There are nat natural law are ideas that in various traditions that have certain overlapping concepts, but those of that as an entity, I, I, I would question. Religious people frequently make the same mistake assuming that from theistic premises, we can deduce Secularity, uh, a kind of general revelation as distinct from special revelation. I think that both sides have to affirm a secularity and both sides have to use their respective metaphysical positions to inform their interpretation of secularity, not deduce secularity therefrom. Uh, okay. Do, do, does that? Uh... Yes, I mean, yes, I think that makes sense and I thank you for for what you said about the natural law not being a, a monolithic thing. That's important. Does anyone have any knowledge of the Pontifical University case? Uh, no. I, I, I don't, but I would just say that, that that is an argument that comes up from time to time where some newspaper will find Catholic University X and say, well, aha, you've been, you've been funding it. And I would just point out um, 
you know, at some level that points out that Catholics and Catholic institutions are humans and, and human institutions, and uh, perfect, uh, getting perfect accord among them is not, uh, not all that likely, but that ultimately the question, the argument should not, should not be a fair argument for the government to make, well, I found some other Catholic over here who does it, therefore sure. you, don't have, you don't have the right to make that objection. And that argument has not entered into our debate, I don't think. It's interesting. Uh, those international cases don't seem to be that relevant for the for the players in our in our debates. Uh, yeah. Just a couple. On, uh, one of the one of the uh, benefits covered, I think it was by the Institute of Medicine edition, is uh, breastfeeding. Um, a lactation consultant teaching women how to breastfeed their children. I think that's a very very good thing. And I would support uh, adding uh, natural family planning to something that should be covered along with, with the other um, you know, benefits. I, I think that, that that's a reasonable request uh, to make. Uh, um, so that, that would be good. In terms of what does the pontifical, the fact that the pontifical university is doing this show, well, you know, you're quite right that I, I don't think, if we're gonna have broad religion coverage under the religion clauses, you know, we don't go very deep, right? I mean, you know, you sort of, sincerity becomes the test. Um, because then once you start testing more things other than sincerity, you know, uh, you're, you're getting too much entangled in the, in the religion, for one thing. That's not one thing we want the government to do. And, and um, secondly, you know, not all religions function doctrinally um, in the same way that the Catholic Church does, so there may not be a clear way of doing this. But I think it is appropriate for Roman Catholics who are receiving all of this information from, from the bishops to say, well, you say this is against our teaching to pay for this. What about that? You're a pontifical university. You're in Rome. I mean, could you please explain to us why the cooperation with evil analysis runs one way over there and another way here? I think it's certainly something that the Catholic community can and should talk about. And David Novak, as always, is correct. Okay, we're, we're making good progress here. We've got um, three hands over here, one hand here. Let's start with John Langan. Uh, I'd just like to add to the present discussion that what this reflects is the very powerful factors in our culture, uh, in, our, in our politics, in our legal thinking, and increasingly in, our, in the way we do theology uh, to fit moral reasoning into a highly deductive pattern and uh, to pre place an enormous value on consistency across cases. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a reflection of very broad features of American culture. Uh, and the fact is that the church is operative in many different cultures. And uh, it's to the interest of the people who are promoting this particular style of theology to conceal that fact and to, uh, or at least soft, soft pedal it. Uh, and I think the, 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 the objection is not um, in itself it should not be de de decisive of anything. It should be, can be regarded also as an incentive to further and more, more careful analysis. But uh, if, if we think that the church operates in some kind of cultural vacuum and can be expected to arrive at the same results in Rwanda and Chicago, uh, we're deluding ourselves. Marilyn? I'm Marilyn McMorrow at Georgetown. We've talked about whether maybe rights, it's good if they conflict, and we talked about maybe they really aren't in conflict. But I guess what I'm still wondering about is the extent to which we presume that religious freedom is an absolute right. And I think it's a qualified right. I happen to agree with the ICCPR that freedom to manifest one's religions or beliefs, and it is beliefs too, may be subject to limitations prescribed by law and are necessary for those categories of public safety, order, health, morals, and the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. So it sounds as though we're not looking at the question to, to me, it sounds as though we're not looking at the question to which the religious freedom right might be qualified. And I wondered if yeah. any of you had anything to say about that. Just to add to that, uh, we heard this morning, Dignitatis Humane also refers to the exercise of religious freedom within due limits. So. That's a kind of gray zone we may want to explore. I, I think I 
I was trying to do that by saying, you know, this battle of abstract rights and that, you know, what is at stake is, is something that pertains to the common good. So I don't want to, in the Catholic tradition, the idea that a right would be, you know, trumped absolutely rather than qualified and fit in, I, um, it seems uh, different. And I could just, let me just add, uh, uh, if I may, that I think that's true in the legal tradition, the American legal tradition as well. I don't think there's any question uh, in fact, uh, that's, that's part of the reason that we have conflict, is that uh, religious liberty is not an absolute right. If it were an absolute light, right, we wouldn't have this panel. We would always win. Uh, and, and we don't. Uh, in fact, religious liberty as a constitutional matter uh, throughout the years that the Supreme Court has been uh, ruling on these cases often loses. So it's certainly, the, I think it's absolutely the case that uh, religious liberty is not an absolute right. I can't think of any right that's an absolute right, even life. Can I add one qualifier to that, which is as a matter, <laughs> as a matter of federal law under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, what you read from the international document is not the legal standard as of federal law. The legal standard of federal law is that the government can only impose the burden if they have a compelling government interest and if... Uh, imposing that burden on the person is the least restrictive means of advancing that interest. So the federal statutory law is actually a lot more protective of religion. I agree, it doesn't make it an absolute right, sure. but it's much more protective than the international document is. Okay. Right, we still have lots of um, questions. There are two hands over here. Are there any students uh, who want to uh, pose a question? All right, you, got, you students think of questions. We'll hear these two uh, contributions and then back to the panel and one last round, one last round from the audience, please. Uh, yes, uh, Frank Fletcher. Um, the questions uh, related to reproduction, birth control, contraception, um, abortion, are framed in terms of women's health and uh, are said to touch on issues of uh, gender identity, equality, and discrimination. And this has um, the, these same um, categories applied to educational institutions. The funding of women's sports should be on a par with that of men because unless a, an institution is private like Hillsdale um, and don't accept any federal money, how do we then deal with institutions like Wellesley College, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, that does not allow men to be admitted and yet they receive federal money? And isn't this a contradiction? Okay, right behind the pillar on the, on the corner there. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the Wellesley College uh, question. I would point out, interestingly, the HHS mandate um, requires employers to pay for sterilizations of women, uh, but does not require them to pay for sterilizations of men. So um, maybe there's more of the inconsistency there. Tom, just very quickly, Eugene, Eugene McCarthy. I'd just like to ask the same question I asked informally, Tom, to yourself, to the panel. When a Catholic institution, like a hospital or an adoption agency, is using money of its own, of course it can establish its own rules. When it seeks support from a federal source, uh, do the rules of the game change? In other words, you accept the money on the terms from which, of your funding agency. Is that, a, is that a legitimate point of view, or is it rather, or is it rather, as I think the Archbishop was, uh, the Cardinal indicated this morning, we have been working very effectively in providing these services at a cost-effective level for, for decades now. Uh, why should the rules change in that regard? You know the quality of our services, the social needs are there, and you run the risk, as happened in the Archdiocese of uh, Westminster, my own uh, country of birth, that the church... Uh, faced with the same um, dilemma from the, from the Labour government, just basically said, we will opt out of adoption services because we don't agree with what the, the Labour government has said, and they opted out. And everybody in that, in, in that view, in my view, uh, lost. But I'd just like a quick reaction on that point. I think the answer, the answer is twofold. One, where the government is spending money, I think the government sometimes can attach strings to that money, but there are limits on the ways in which the government can attach strings. Uh, from my point of view, I agree with you, everybody loses. If the Catholic Church can do 85 or 90 percent of the adoptions in town and can help with the problem, the idea of saying, you won't go with us 100 percent of the way, therefore you're not eligible to be here at all, strikes me as a bad policy idea. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that most of the restrictions we've been talking about, the HHS mandate, the restrictions on pharmacies, pharmacists have nothing at all to do with acceptance of federal funds. In other words, the, the, the mandate that you have to give the contraceptive insurance has nothing at all to do. If you accept federal funds, you don't accept federal funds, totally unrelated. If you're here and you're in business, you're, you're providing it. Good. All right, let's have a final round of questions. Um, keep your hands up so I know where to go next. Yes? Uh-huh. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Kelly Thomas. I'm a sophomore here at the SFS. Um, my question was, somebody brought up earlier how a lot of the HHS mandate and the contraception has been turned into a women's rights issue. And how do you propose going forward in terms of asking for compromises and policy um, from the government, how to get it back to a rights issue, not a women's rights issue? And how do you phrase it in such a way that you don't come across as anti-women? Because I know um, people who have been advocating for religious religious freedom have taken a lot of heat for that. So how do, I think this would probably be, um, I don't know really which one of you would like to take this one, but how would you propose going forward and getting it back to that essential issue without coming across as anti-women? Thank, Thank you. Let's collect a few more and then we'll give the panelists a chance to wrap up. Roger, yeah. and then right here. I, I think Kathy uh, originally suggested there was perhaps a religious freedom argument for people who in fact wanted uh, uh, not to oppose the contraceptive mandate because they had different beliefs perhaps based on natural law. But it seems to me, I mean, that doesn't seem to me to apply because the issue isn't what do people do? Are we going to allow people to act in this way, get contraception? The question is who pays for it? Should we pay for what they want to do? And I think it's a very dangerous argument that the state should be providing all of this or should insist that these things be, provi be provided. And I say that because... Um, I come obviously from Britain where we have a national health service which has now got to the point of actually being quite willing to accept contraceptives being more or less, for well I won't say forced, but encouraged on children under 16 in schools without their parents' knowledge. So the state is taking over undermining family life. I don't think one even has to think contraception is wrong to be worried about that. So the two things seem to be two different arguments. Okay, right here in front, this is our last question, I think. Uh, David, did you have your hand up? No? Okay, one more in the back after this, and then we'll go to the panel. Right here. Sir, please. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, yes. Um, when you mentioned before that uh, the cooperation of evil is, is not something that you can say that's a violation of the religion, what about Mark 14, 38? Jesus said, don't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And really... Basically, what, it, what the HHS mandate is doing is coercing a religious adherent to consent to an always available temptation to violate religion in practice in order to be eligible for another non-offensive religion group health insurance benefits. And that's a religion, that's a, actually I proved it, I could, I'll give you the, that's a First Amendment right, period. It's not a compelling state interest, you're wrong. All three of you are blind, Every lawyer is blind. You're talking about that okay. there's a... There's okay, a, there's a, okay. Right. thank you. So, but what, what do you think about that? <laughs> there you would, go. Would, 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 <laughs> it, would it be question. a violation of the religion about Mark 13, 14, 38? Thank you. And last question, David. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Mark, I, I found your comments very helpful, both Marks, of course, but uh, I found your comments very helpful, but I wanted to just push you a little, because you gave an ex you try to do a bifurcation between when the government's involved and is doing so, that's one thing. When the government's not involved, and then you gave us a series of things, all of which I thought were drawn to make your case kind of easy. I think you would, make, you would acknowledge that, take your pharmacy uh, availability, there are a vast array of locations in the country where there aren't CVS, there's 36 of them, or where there may be a single town and there's one, uh, there's one pharmacy and a woman really needs, um, uh, uh, you know, who is raped or whatever, for whatever reason, just needs to get the, um, uh, the morning after uh, pill, not is poor, doesn't have easy access to a car or transportation, uh, et cetera. You're talking about a real burden now. Walk us through how you think about that situation in terms of the analysis that you were uh, discussing before. And Kathy, I don't know if you want to join on that one also. Right, well, I think uh, enough questions have been raised uh, that each of you might take a couple of minutes to address what you'd like to address and maybe provide any final comments that you have. Let's start at the end with, with Mark. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, first, I love any questioner who says all lawyers are blind. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think it's fair enough. Um, on, on the question somebody asked previously about religious freedom of, of employees, I have to say I, I do disagree with that construct. Um, I don't view myself as having, you know, my, my boss is in the back of the room, I don't view myself as having free speech rights vis-a-vis -vis my boss because I work at a private institution. Um, I cannot be discriminated against because of my religion under Title VII. That's true. Um, but I don't think every time my employer chooses not to buy me something, um, whether it's because I want to go out and read the Koran or I want to go out and buy, um, 
you know, some other book. You know, I, to me, it is not an infringement on my religious liberty that my employer chooses not to pay for something. I don't think that's imposing anything on me. Uh, I get my salary. I'm a free person. I can do what I want. Um, in terms of how to be not anti-woman, um, you know, I, I think that's hard, frankly, because of, because of the way the issue is spun in the media. I mean, I honestly viewed uh, the entire convention last week as largely pushed toward making clear that anybody who, who disagrees on this issue is, in fact, anti-woman. Um, I think it's flagrantly and obviously not true. And I, one thing I like about litigating, frankly, is that when you get in front of a judge, the oh, you're anti-woman argument really fades away. Um, and, and, and you get down to the, the more the type of arguments Kathy was making, where the government has to lay out its claim and say, here is why we're doing what we're doing, and here is why we think it passes uh, constitutional statutory muster. Um, I think the truth is when they're actually forced to do that, government's going to have a very bad one loss record uh, on this case. To get to the last question on the really remote pharmacy issue, um, one, that's the, the one or two percent. That's not the, that's not the most of it. Um, and these laws apply to all of them. So if the government was actually just concerned about that, um, I would be much more sympathetic to a regulation that just spoke in those terms as opposed to one that regulates everybody. Uh, but even in those terms, it seems to me that if the government's view is that there is a compelling need for people in location X to have a certain service, uh, then the right response is for the government to provide it or the government to work with willing providers to provide it. In other words, if there's no one who's willing to provide an abortion in rural state X, uh, to me, the much better response is if the government thinks that's a problem, the government ought to provide someone there. And if Planned Parenthood thinks that's a problem, Planned Parenthood, the willing provider, ought to go there. Uh, when, when we look at counties that have no one who will deliver a baby, uh, and there are plenty of places where you'd have to go 50, 60 miles to get to an OBGYN to deliver a baby, we never talk about that issue as those doctors who, for financial reasons, stop doing it, infringing the rights of anybody else. We, nobody ever talks about that as an infringement of anyone else's rights because it's not, because people choosing not to facilitate your own choices, choosing not to give you that service, choosing not to be involved for financial reasons, we all just accept. We say that's fine. We only call it a big conflict of rights when it's religion. Um, I agree those are tougher cases. I still think the right answer is in those cases, the government ought to find a way to provide it. Uh, and, and that ought to be the preferred way rather than telling individuals, you can't be in this business unless you're willing to do X. Kathy? Um, I think that what, what's at stake here in America is uh, an enormous social experiment, and I guess I disagree with you, Professor, about whether or not it's good. I think what's at stake is trying to provide a basic package of benefits to everybody in this country, a, a minimum benefit package. That package is going to have to be defined by someone and it's you know, going to be defined by the Institute of Medicine and, 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 and other, the HHS and by groups that are responsible in a democratic way to, um, to those people uh, you know, who elected them or uh, you know, who, who will come up and eventually vote themselves, whether or not they were elected. I don't, um, I recognize that this can go too far, and maybe in England it has gone too far, but the idea of having a basic benefit package, which seems to be, you know, your objection, is, is not one th that I share. On employers, I mean, I think the question is, look, look how difficult it is to get employment. Uh, many people are forced to work in places, not forced literally, but pressured by financial services to work in places where they can get a job. For me, the question is, is there a basic set of benefits that should be available to you no matter where you work, no matter what kind of employee you work for? What I worry about with this argument about religious freedom is I think what this undoes eventually, and I do worry about consistency, is a mandate altogether. If I don't want to provide, um, you know, smoking counseling because I think you should be able to quit on your own, I've got an objection to that that's religious or moral. If I don't want to pl provide a blood transfusion, you know, it, it, well, then I don't have to because I don't think you need it. A lot of these services, you know, may be objected to on various grounds by all sorts of people. Are we getting rid of a notion of a mandated benefit package? I think that sentence I quoted from United States versus Lee points to the fact that, you know, 
we do have not just the religious liberty of the employer at stake. I agree that it's at stake. But if I'm forced to sacrifice something that is a right somewhere else that I'm actually paying for too, probably you could even say I'm paying for the contraceptive coverage and because p policies with contraceptive coverage, if, if it's insurance, are cheaper than policies without it because childbirth is more expensive than, um, you know, uh, than preventing uh, pregnancy. So you could, how, I, I may be even paying more as an employee uh, for a policy that uh, doesn't cover the contraception I need, my proportional contribution. So I'd like to see it, try to think about how it looks at all different levels. The government level, which represents all of us, some sort of common morality, an employer who, whose ability to shape the religious uh, and moral lives of his employees is solely due to the fact that he's made a lot of money and is employing them, and then the employee. So I think we've got to break down the analysis and see the religious liberty at every um, level. On, uh, on the third question, I, again, I do worry about comparisons. Uh, one of the cases that came up in the bishop's letter on religious liberty was, well, you know, they kicked, uh, what was it, the, one of the CRS services out of providing care for the migrant workers because they wouldn't refer for abortion or contraception. And a lot of these women were in, uh, you know, very difficult circumstances. They were... Um, uh, you know, uh, sexually trafficked in some cases. Uh, and, and the Catholic group did a tremendously good job of caring for them, the best job. But it wasn't, it wouldn't tell them about services that were available to them legally and protected, whether you agree or not, by the Constitution. And, and the church objected to the fact that they weren't allowed to participate. But how would we feel and what would be the difference if we said, you know, if atheist relief services said, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a really great job of taking care of these migrants uh, too, but I'm not going to refer them to church groups or counseling groups that are based in churches or synagogues or mosques because I think religion itself is a wrong thing. And I think under those circumstances, you'd want the government to say, hey, if you're not willing at least to tell where somebody can get something that they might need that's a constitutional service, we can't give you the contract because the money supporting this is everyone's money. So I think that's a lot harder question. Thank you. Mark? So I'll, I'll just conclude, and my answers <laughs> will be directed at the, the young woman uh, who asked the question about how do we... Um, how do we reframe? There's, there's been a lot of talk about reframing. Reframing the discussion so that we're talking, you may not have used that word, but I'm paraphrasing. Reframe the discussion so that we're not, we're talking about, about religious rights or rights as opposed to women's rights. Or, and I, I'm sorry to be bleak, uh, but I don't think that it's possible to do this. I think that um, there is no reframing. The reason why there's no reframing is that behind the rhetoric that the Democratic and Republican convention uh, uh, speeches um, uh, represent are true and real beliefs about the different ways that we ought to rank values in conflict. So we've got health, right? We've got the quote unquote, the rhetoric of women's health, if you want to call it that way. But um, it seems to me that that isn't just rhetoric. That's what a lot of people believe is a primary, if not an absolute value. And the people that believe that believe that when the sorts of religious liberty concerns which come into conflict with that right to women's health characterized in that way, those rights ought to, as a general matter, be subordinated to those. Other people disagree. The rhetoric coming out of the Republican convention sees things differently. So there is no simple answer about just you know, reframing or shifting the rhetoric, because behind the rhetoric stand true and deep and irreconcilable conflicts. And that's why, ultimately, I think I agree with Mark that the way, one of the best ways to resolve these, these matters, to the, to the extent they can be resolved, to reach compromise, is through law.